Hey guys, welcome back to the second part of this two-part blog post around the extension one release for 3ds Max 2015. So in the first video we saw how we could use the open subdiv and preset modifiers to quickly create some compelling models um, using uh, crease values to define filleted edges um, and hard edges on our models. And then we looked at how we can take those models, bring them into Maya and have that um, crease values and those presets be persistent across the applications. Um, in this video, we're going to look at how we can take those models and use the Bifrost engine to create some uh, liquid simulations. So we're going to have water come out of the spout and fall into the sink and then go down the sinkhole. Um, and then later on, we're going to take that water simulation and bring it back inside of 3ds Max uh, via the Alembic file format. So before I get started here, there's something that I need to explain about how Bifrost understands and detects geometry. So these objects right now are being smoothed only at the preview level. So if I hit one, you'll see I have my low res model. And this is what Bifrost is actually going to detect uh, when we start defining collision objects. That's because Bifrost doesn't see uh, the smoothed preview. Um, so in order to fix this, all we need to do is come into the mesh, go into smooth, and start adding some uh, division levels here. Of course, using the open subdiv um, algorithm. So I'll, I'll just select two here and hit apply. And you'll see that my model is a little bit more smooth than my low res model. Now, it's not as smooth as my high res model, but that's okay because as far as, you know, Bifrost simulation is concerned, this is going to be pretty much a sufficient amount of geometry. Um, and you'll notice also that I'm not actually going to do anything to my spout geometry. And that's because if I go into my low res, you'll see that my low res and my high res are, you know, follow the same trajectory as far as geometry goes. What the open subdiv really does is add those filleted edges, which don't really affect the Bifrost simulation. So we don't have to worry about it too much. So we're going to get started here. The first thing we want to do is uh, define an emissive object. So we're going to create a cube position it pretty much anywhere we want and just make sure that it is going to be within our spell. So I'm going to get real close here and go into wire, oops, go into wireframe mode, position it like that. I'm going to scale it down a little bit and you want to make sure that it's quite snug within the, uh, within the spout. Bifrost will do a pretty good job of detecting collision uh, geometry, collision colliding faces and do a pretty good job of not going through that through them, and if it does, we can fix that, and I'll show you guys how to do that in a second. So we wanna make sure that it's pretty snug within our, our spout. Uh, the next thing we need to do, and I'm gonna come into shaded mode to illustrate a point here. This spout actually has a hole behind it. So it has two holes, one in the front, one in the back. Um, and this is not gonna be good for Bifrost because Bifrost is actually going to simulate the water going through both ends of the spout, and of course we don't want that. So what we need to do is actually cap that hole. Uh, to do so really quickly, we're just going to create a copy of this box, bring it back out here, um, and just scale it out, and make sure that um, it's pretty much blocking all of that hole there as such. If I go back into shaded mode, you see that uh, it's pretty much blocking that hole the way we want it to. So scale out. Um, one last thing we need to also define, actually before I define that, I'm going to set up Bifrost the way I, uh, it needs to be set up. So come into my window, go into my outliner, select my PQ1, and come into Bifrost um, and add uh, create liquid. So there we go, we've defined our liquid, and then we need to make sure our Bifrost node is selected, and then select our colliding object, so the spout, the sink, and that box behind it, and come into Bifrost and say add collider. And one last thing we want to make sure that we define is a kill plane. So as the scene is set up right now, the water is going to come out of the spout, fall into the sink, and then go down the sinkhole and just keep simulating that water and those voxels that Bifrost is going to create are just going to keep going down and down and down, thus increasing the amount of uh, simulation data unnecessarily. So we want to make sure that once the water reaches the bottom of this sinkhole, that it, it stops existing, essentially uh, killing the simulation at that point. So with the Bifrost node um, selected, we come into Bifrost and say add a kill plane. We're going to select that kill plane and bring it below our sinkhole. We can probably come into an orthographic view just to see more or less what we're doing. It doesn't really matter what, where we put it as long as it 
it falls on the correct axis that we want to kill the voxels at. So there we go. Uh, the next thing I want to do is select my Bifrost node and come into my uh, Bifrost liquid container attribute editor. And I want to make sure I adequately set up my master voxel size. This is the most important value to define in Bifrost. This will really uh, determine how many voxels will get created, the quality of the simulation as a whole. And it's really relative to the uh, scale of your scene. For example, if you're simulating a waterfall versus simulating a droplet of water, this value will change dramatically. I know for this particular scene, a value of 0.05 is uh, pretty satisfactory. If I was doing, for example, maybe a uh, waterfall, maybe a value of 0.1 would be okay. And if I was doing a droplet of water, like I said, maybe a value of 0.005 would be uh, more adequate. Um, also, and because I've, whoop, because I've tried this um, in the past, I know that when I hit simulate, now what's going to happen is that the water is going to sort of trickle out the spout very slowly. Um, it's not going to look very natural when you open up, when you open, you know, a water faucet, water tends to come out a uh, much higher velocity. And so one, one of the ways we can uh, fix this by is by actually selecting our pcube one and coming to the Bifrost attributes, liquid emission, and setting our expansion rate something a little bit higher, like 0.75. And now what this is gonna do is actually going to make the uh, liquid emission expand at a higher rate, thus filling up the spout faster and thus creating pressure uh, on making the water exit the spout at a much higher, at a higher rate. So that's what this value is going to do. The counter uh, effect of this value is that because there is more pressure within the spout, there's a higher likelihood of water voxels penetrating or going through the spout geometry. So one of the ways we can fix that is by selecting the spout itself, um, coming into our attribute editor, coming into the Bifrost parameters here, and under collision, we can define a thickness value. So by default, it's set to one. I know in this example that a value of two is going to be satisfactory. So that's going to increase essentially the thickness of our colliding objects, uh, this particular colliding object. So at this point, I'm pretty much ready to hit uh, play. Before doing so, I'm just going to make sure that I have enough frames to simulate with. So I want to simulate for 200 frames. I'm going to go back to frame one and I will hit play. Now this is going to simulate and you'll see that if I select the Bifrost uh, container, the green frames are the frames that have been simulated um, and the yellow frames are the ones that have been submitted to the background compute process uh, for Bifrost. Um, I'm going to pause the video now and come back once this simulation um, is complete and we'll uh, follow the next steps after that. All right, so now my Bifrost sim is fully simulated. As you can see down here at the timeline, all the frames are green. This is essentially telling me that all the frames that were submitted to the background compute have been returned with a um, simulated frame. If I hit the playback button here, you'll see the water come out of the spout. These are voxels being displayed in the viewport. They fall into the sink, of course, go down the sinkhole um, and exit the sink and then get killed by the kill plane um, below uh, the sink, as you can see there. So at this point now, what I want to do is actually convert these voxels into geometry so that I can bring it back inside of 3ds Max. So to do so, what I'm going to do is actually make sure the Bifrost shape is selected, come into my Bifrost shape attribute editor, um, come down into Bifrost meshing, and enable uh, the Bifrost uh, meshing. So when I hit playback here, as every frame um, is being displayed in the viewport, a uh, mesh is being generated of that, um, of that simulation. Now this process again does take a little bit of time, so I'm gonna pause the video as uh, this is happening and come back when this process is complete. All right, so my Bifrost simulation has been converted to a mesh, as you can see here in the viewport. I, can, I now have a Bifrost mesh one node in my outliner that I can select. And we have 200 frames of this deforming uh, mesh, which was our Bifrost uh, simulation. So now I want to bring this into 3ds Max. So what I can do is actually, with the Bifrost Mesh 1 selected, uh, come into my pipeline cache, Alembic cache, export selection to Alembic. I'm going to put this uh, somewhere on my desktop. It doesn't really matter. I'll call this uh, Bifrost Sim um, and hit export selection. This is, so this is actually going to go, again, frame by frame and create 
that Alembic file, which I'll then be able to bring inside of 3ds Max. So again, I'm going to pause the video while this process uh, happens. Uh, we'll come back at the end of uh, this uh, converting to Alembic file. All right, so now that we've finished saving out our Alembic file, what we can do is come back inside of 3ds Max and import uh, that Alembic data and have it line up nicely with the existing geometry. Uh, so to do so, just a couple things I need to make sure I do. Uh, I need to make sure that my frame rate is set to the same as Maya. So by default, Maya is set to 24 frames per second, and I didn't change that in Maya. So I want to make sure that I uh, fix that in max, or else we won't have the same um, animation um, scaling. So we're going to set that to film, which is uh, 24 frames a second. Um, and then I'm just going to scrub my timeline here to show you that there is currently no uh, water coming through the faucet. Um, and then if I come into File Import and navigate to my location on disk, which I, where I saved the Alembic file, um, and hit uh, fit uh, time range here, so um, we leave that as such. Um, and, and there you go, the uh, water, uh, the geometry of the water, which was uh, a few seconds ago inside of Maya, is now living inside of Max. So there you have it, um, open subdiv for quick modeling. Um, we can bring that data inside of Maya and have it persistent. Uh, we can then use that data to uh, create some um, some simulations with the bypass engine and then bring that back into Max via Alembic. Um, and here is the, the final result. I did prepare some renders for you guys, which I'll show you. This is an ambient occlusion pass of this bathroom scene um, and a, a mental ray uh, rendered sequence of, uh, of the same of the same scene. So there you go. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or um, any comments, leave them in the comments field.